Divine Truth Interviews. Jesus, Mary, and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of emotions. The interview was held on the 29th of April 2014 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session three, part two. What are addictions? <laughs> well, addictions are the result of suppressing emotions inside the soul, such as fear or painful emotions, such as grief, that uh, in an attempt to do so, we have to create a whole nother group of emotions that, are, that we call desires, uh -huh. that are, help us to deny, suppress, resist, or substitute mm -hmm. for painful emotional experiences. And, and so addictions are inside of the soul yeah. and they are created by, a, a, they're basically desires that are created by the suppression of certain fears. Gotcha. In particular fears, but it could also be the suppression of other types of emotions such as grief. Or shame. Or shame or other yeah. kinds of emotions. Yeah. So, so addictions are very, very powerful tools to avoid painful emotions. Mm. And as such, most people find, have a huge struggle giving them up. Yeah. And particularly giving them up if they're emotional, but even if they're physical addictions, giving them up is often very, very difficult. Okay, so let's talk about that because you, in your... Let's talk about the types of addictions. The yeah. types of addictions, yeah. yeah. Um, and in your preamble there, you basically just said that uh, they're all emotional, really. They are all emotional. Yeah. Well, they're, they're generated by the, by the desire to suppress certain emotions. Okay. Is probably more accurate. Yeah. So then addictions can take different forms, but they're all generated by an emotional desire to suppress... suppress. Fear or design, other... deny or resist or, or substitute, gotcha. put something in lieu of. Yeah. Great. You know, sometimes it's easier to suppress an emotion by having another one instead, yes. <laughs> for example. So let's talk about that. There's three main forms of addiction. Yes. And the first being emotional. Of course. So, so... so emotional is where we're using an emotion mm -hmm. that has to come from either within us or outside of us. Yep. And usually it comes from outside of us because it doesn't exist within us. Yeah. So usually it's an emotion we expect someone in our environment to give us yep. in order to suppress or deny or resist replace or a, replace yeah. a negative, painful feeling that we have inside of us. Okay. So, you know, we could come up with probably examples there of what, you know, of what, uh, are such emotions. So, for example, between a husband and wife, there could be very many emotional addictions, couldn't there? Like, if I don't want to feel lonely or unwanted or alone or, or unsafe, un unattractive or unsafe, yes. I could want my husband to supply all, all of those, of those emotions things. to me. That would be emotional addiction. And you'll think you're in love with him when he does. Yes. <laughs> feel super you attracted. You feel super attracted to him because yeah. he supplies your addiction of your, you know, safety. He supplies yeah. your addiction to make yourself feel good about yourself. He yeah. supplies your... And because he's supplying all of these addictions, you'll just think you're head over heels in love with him when reality is it's all codependent addiction. Yeah, because you know what happens? <laughs> when you're near that person, suddenly all these things that you're trying so hard, to, you have the active desire to suppress, yeah. suddenly in the presence of that person, they, you don't feel that... Um, them that anymore. You don't feel them anymore. And they're you find it really, us. really easy to suppress yeah, when you're with them. They're easy to suppress, so you think, this is great being with this person, this must this be love. This is love. Yeah. This is love. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not. <laughs> it's just an emotional, codependent addiction. And obviously the other person usually has to be getting something out of it as well. You're probably giving something to them emotionally. Of course, yes. of course. They're, you know, yeah. they're probably getting something in return for supplying these particular emotions to you. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be in the relationship with you yeah. unless they believe that that's all they're worth, which of course many people do yeah. because of how they've been treated when they're young. Yeah. So, so, so you have two groups of people generally created in these emotional codependent addictions. There's one group of addictions who are, uh, of people who I'd call the abuser of the mm -hmm. addiction, mm -hmm. and there's the other one who's called the supplier of the addiction. Yeah. The abuser of the addiction generally is the person who demands the addiction be met, 
and the supplier and feels like they have a just right to expect that addiction to be met mm -hmm. and the supplier of the addiction generally feels that they should meet that addiction and that's the loving thing to do. That's how they obtain their worth. That's how they obtain their worth. In yep. other words, they have low worth yep. and they give their worth, they get their worth by supplying the addiction to the abuser. Yes, yep. gotcha. And when I say abuser, I, I'm referring to almost all marriage relationships on this planet at the moment are generally have one abuser and one supplier mm. um, and most of them think they're in love <laughs> <laughs> at least initially at least initially um. <laughs> of course because it's impure emotion and out of harmony with god's love and truth eventually it creates pain so yes. after a while they don't believe they're in love anymore <laughs> yeah but but oftentimes the pull of the emotional addiction is so strong that they don't remove themselves from that relationship or they seek another one that will that's supply. identical yes. yes so they'll go from one relationship to another relationship to another relationship that's identical or you find people making swaps to opposites mm -hmm. so in other words they were abused in one relationship yep so they were the abuser in one relationship so they got very angry about the abuse that occurred in that relationship and so with the next relationship they become the abuser yes of the relationship yep. in other words they have all the demands and the expectations and the other person must fulfill them and is it possible for an for a couple to be in the situation where one is the abuser in one area and and the other is the abuser in the, another area? Yes, definitely. Yep. Yep. It depends completely upon the emotional experience of both of them when they were children. Yep. So it doesn't mean that, So and usually that's in practice what happens. So mm -hmm. one abuses in one area, one abuses in the other, and they, you know, they make allowances. Uh, yes. uh, they, you know, they're told to in marriage counselling to yeah. compromise with each other yeah. on these issues. So they make allowances for each other's abuse, yeah. and the other makes allowances for each each other the times someone's given them some love. Yes. And of course, they think that's a loving relationship, and it's not. Yeah. Of course, a loving relationship. It's a codependent relationship mm -hmm. primarily, but the majority of people are in them. To me, uh, and I can I say, go ahead. The main reason why they're in them is because they meet their addictions or the majority of their addictions. And, and the reality is, if somebody meets none of your addictions, it's highly likely you don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we are a person who's humble to some of these emotions yes. of fear, shame, grief, yes. then, and that's what I found from this example we we're talking about, is that we're so driven by addiction in our life that mm. it's basically the primary thing we're seeking unless we're humble to some of those other emotions Correct. and entire relationships marriages families professions it's all based on Correct. the avoidance of these these feelings yes. and it's an epidemic it's an a epidem global yeah. epidemic it's the worst epidemic it's worse than any disease yes worse because yeah. it creates most diseases as well by the way yeah. So it's worse than any disease. Yeah. And, and like this is one reason too why I, I'm probably one of the least liked people <laughs> is because, yeah. when, because I don't feed people's addictions very much at all, if at all. Yeah. The majority of people don't feel comfortable when they're around me. Yeah. Even though I'm being loving to them and truthful with them, they don't feel comfortable around me because I'm not feeding what they define as addiction. As they, well, sorry, they define as love. Yeah. But it's just love masquerading. Yes. Like it's just addiction masturbating as love. Yes. That's all it is. Yeah. And uh, it is one of the main reasons, uh, one of the main you know, ways we manage to avoid darker and more painful emotions. Mm. Hence the desire for it is so being so strong. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so emotional, the emotional way is the first way. And that's seemingly the, the biggest a lot of addictions on the planet would you say? Well I don't know I you know if you look at the uh, how addictions are when you look at the three in yeah, the list in the end that. you probably would have to say that they're all pretty much well <laughs> and extensively used by the majority of people yeah. but I think the emotional ones are sometimes the more difficult ones to see. They're sort of insidious aren't and they're they? insidious and they have less judgment attached to them yeah. and what I mean by that is that many times the physical addictions have some judgments attached to them whereas the emotional addictions don't have any judgments attached to them. In fact, we judge them as loving and nice. Mm. Uh, in fact, they are supported in society most of the time. And because of that, uh, unravelling emotional addictions are, is one of the most difficult undertakings that a person will ever need to undertake mm -hmm. in their relationship with God. Mm -hmm. 
because God is always wanting you to unravel all of your emotional addictions. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> obviously God wants to help you to get what's underneath them, which are all your fears and, and the painful emotions that you need to experience. That will heal you. So God's created a whole law system in the universe towards the human soul, triggering the fact that when you follow your addictions, you're going to have a more painful life. And this is why most people follow their addictions and eventually see the pain from following their addictions. And then they stop following that addiction only to substitute with another mm. and then follow that addiction. And, and unless we are very sincere, we will never get to the real cause of most of our emotional addictions. Yeah. 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 We have to be very sincere to get there. And that's great. Yeah. Because with God, everything has to be very sincere. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It, it requires deep honesty. Mm. And wouldn't you want to know yourself that well? Yes. And wouldn't God want you to know yourself that yes. well? So it requires a huge amount of exercise of your will to actually get to the state where you really do want to know what your addictions are mm -hmm. because those emotional addictions are covering over all the things that can heal you if you experience them. Yeah. So, so you definitely want to get there. And this is one reason also why most, if not all, uh, processes that people have for their emotions don't work mm. because the majority of them work around the addiction. So the addiction remains in play. And while the addiction remains in play, you will never feel the true causal emotion. Yeah. So, so of course, most of these techniques that people have to get to their emotions actually do not work. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you have a sincere desire to face your real addictions, and firstly, this first group, the emotional ones, are the most difficult to face, probably because they are the most insidious, and you, you are going to very much struggle in your relationship with God or even your relationship with yourself mm -hmm. or your relationship with anyone else mm -hmm. because you're not going to be real while you have those addictions. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. let's go on to the next group. So what's the next group? <laughs> well, well, uh, I'll outline, I'll let you know the next two. So yes. we've, firstly, we've discussed emotional addiction. So we've first focused on the emotions. Yep. yep. Then we have physical addictions and substance addictions. Yes. So, so let's separate the yep, two of those. Yep. I've separated these two on purpose because physical addictions are not always substances. Yes. They can be situations mm -hmm. that create your comfort. Yeah. So, for example, you know, a lot of people when they've been had a hard day's work, the first thing they need is to go home and sit in front of the telly. Yeah. Right. So it's no longer it's not a substance they're abusing there, mm -hmm. but rather a situation that makes them feel comfortable to help them to avoid. help them avoid yeah. the stuff that's triggered them during the day. Mm -hmm. And that's an addiction. It creates an addiction. This is why video games, TV, you know, situa situations where you want to go down the beach all the time or you've got to jog every morning or, yes. you know, things that you've got to do every day yeah. are all an indication of physical ways that you're using to avoid specific things. And so they, therefore they are physical addictions. Yeah. 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 And these physical addictions can also be quite insidious because the majority of them are not frowned upon by society. No. So society accepts them. Heck, most of society <laughs> is engaged in exactly. a vast number of them. And in fact, society's <laughs> whole businesses are created yes. for them in yes. society. That's the reality. So, yeah. so physical addictions are just as insidious a lot of mm -hmm. times as emotional addictions because most of the time we believe we like them, but we have no idea why we like them. And we feel that the imperative to have them, even though we've got no idea why there's such an imperative to have them. Yeah. And, and they're usually a very, very strong. As soon as they are taken away from us, these particular things, these circumstances. So if we come home and the television's broke. Yes. Then the average person reverts to rage. Yes. And there's the indication of the addiction. Yes. Uh, they get angry. Yeah. Every time you get angry, you're indicating the addictions in play, what it is. Yeah. And so we have a way of measuring your addiction. Yes. Through anger. And we'll talk about anger later. Yeah. But... The physical addictions I find interesting because they are, again, another set of addictions that are generally accepted, acceptable to society. Yeah. Most people in society are completely unaware of how they're using them in an addictive way to suppress emotion. Mm -hmm. 
and also they have are unaware of the dangers of that these particular addictions cause mm -hmm. and then the opposite swing of society is some society do see these particular addictions and so they create a whole heap of laws like you shouldn't watch telly or you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that you know they create what do you so mean? some religions for example start oh, creating laws of what should and shouldn't be done yes and they become very strict about what needs to yes. be done with with physical addictions because they see them as addictions yeah. but but they're afraid of them still yes so so mm -hmm. instead of instead of uh, acknowledging that you could use it and it's an exercise of your will they take away your right to use it they try to decline you access to your own will yes mm. and inherent in that though is the assumption that every part or every use of that physical activity or situation or event is addictive and yes. that's not necessarily the case either definitely is it? not in fact you can use many of these physical things as completely the opposite yes you can actually and the same applies to your emotions of course yeah. you can use them in the completely opposite circumstance and actually find the addiction you have yeah. and find the fear that is underneath yes. them by by engaging in some activities with a different exercise of your will and and also the the um, desire driving that activity might not be to suppress it might be as you said to find the the addiction correct but also it might be just that we feel like going for a walk is a good thing to do for our body. We don't feel compelled to do it through the desire to control Correct. our body or suppress our emotion. Correct. We just feel like uh, it's a healthy thing to do. I'm going yeah. to go and do it. Yeah, the key is if you take away the physical act, mm -hmm. what does the person do? Yeah. If they get angry, annoyed, upset, in, in fact, from slight annoyance onwards, mm -hmm. they are in addiction with it. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's the measure of whether the addiction's in play or not. That's, yeah. Yeah, it's a very good thing yeah. to point out. Yeah. yeah. Now, that was the second one, that, so that's so physical. physical and we've separated that from substances, yep. for I think for fairly obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Substances are addictions that you can get met um, through the imbibing of yep. certain things that make the addiction seem to disappear. So they make, make the, the emotions. underlying emotions yes. seem to disappear, sorry. Yep. Now, this is like uh, substance abuses, if you like. So mm -hmm. alcohol, drugs, but they could also be substances that, again, society doesn't seem to have much of an issue with, like food, for example. Yes. Or, or coffee. Coffee or those, tea or those yeah. kind of substances where, that seemingly very innocent and yet they're being used heavily to suppress fear-based emotions. Mm -hmm from being felt. Mm -hmm. So these substances, we could break the substances area into two areas, societal accept, society accepted yes. and society unaccepted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the society accepted are ones that generally the most of us use <laughs> and feel quite comfortable using and have plenty of justification to use um, in our own internal feelings. Yeah. And then there's the society unaccepted. Mm. And that is the uh, ones that generally are acknowledged of causing the rest of society a lot more damage than the average addiction. Yeah. <laughs> and this is where drugs fall into that category, for example, yeah. and alcohol abuse falls into that category. Mm -hmm. so, so a person is allowed to be addicted to alcohol as long as they don't get drunk all the time and it, it affects as as everybody else. Yes, affect everyone else. So in other yeah. words, they're allowed an addiction to a certain point Mm -hmm. But once the addiction goes beyond that point and turns into where we can't really carry on our life in a self-determined manner yes. from the judgment of society's perspective, yeah. then of course it's now judged from society as bad and therefore needs to be legislated in some way generally. Yeah, and that's interesting, isn't it, when you're saying we're not functioning how society deems that we should be able to function, mm -hmm. when from God's perspective, any kind of reliance on any of these things, emotional, physical or substances, means that we're not functioning in the optimal way anyway. We're using Correct. a substance, a, a, a habit, an emotion a habit. to yeah. function. Yep. And that in itself is saying, there's a big problem. Yes. Yeah. So if we look at these three, basically the first one was emotional. Yeah. And that's, you can see that it's all to do with the relationships that you engage in mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. The second one is physical and that's yep. all to do with the habits you have. Yes. And the third one is, is substance 
based substances, and that's all to do with the physical uh, substances that you are addicted to. Yeah. Right? And all three are effective use are effective in helping you avoid um, uh, your underlying painful emotions. But I'd like to point out something else about all three. Yeah. Some of them do it more easily than others. Uh -huh. So, for example, if you find that a substance is useful in denying an emotion, you will probably use that substance rather than trying to get a person to help you with their emotion. Yes. The reason why is that manipulating a person <laughs> to help you emotionally is harder than just getting the substance. <laughs> yeah. And so generally we'll be attracted to the substance more than we will be to the emotional addiction mm -hmm. associated. Right. Yeah. And it depends a lot on our experience, doesn't it? It does. When it does. these emotions were formed and we started suppressing them. Yes. Because in some situations, in some families perhaps, there's not as much substance as available, but there's a very compliant, uh, or like a parent who wants to create a codependence with their Correct. child. Correct. So and that so will be our, um, our, our drug preferred of choice. jug of choice. <laughs> the yeah. emotional um, fulfill or yes. suppression. And, Something that you've got in the notes here that we, the word we haven't mentioned is that it's a reliance. Yes. And that's that's a good word, to, isn't it? It's yes. an emotional reliance on yes. uh, to suppress. That's use, we're relying emotionally on something to suppress other things, Correct. or we're relying physically on. But Correct. that reliance is that we we're leaning on it. We're needing it we to need it. suppress those yes. things. Yeah. And in fact, for most of us, we need it so much that when it's taken away. We're very annoyed yes. <laughs> when it's taken yeah. away. And that doesn't matter whether it's an emotional one, a physical one, or a substance one. Yeah. <laughs> and just one other thought that occurred to me at, while you were speaking was about the emotional um, addictions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned relationships. We commonly think about that in terms of relationships with people still on earth. Yes. But it's very possible to have these emotional addictions with spirits as of well, course. isn't it? Yeah. Of course. And in fact, many spirits are involved in all three of these particular yeah. things. Yeah. The spirits are involved in the emotional one because they want the same emotions and they find that wherever they live in the spirit world, they can't get them. So they return back to earth wanting those particular mm -hmm. emotions mm -hmm. from other people on earth. This is if they're not developed in love themselves. Correct. If they've still and of course, you'd only ever engage in any addictions if you're not developed in love. Yes. And so that basically, I've just condemned the entire world <laughs> at this point because <laughs> uh, uh, we're heavily with addictions. Yes. which means that we're not very developed in love. And I think you can pretty much see from what is happening in, on the earth that yes, we're definitely not very developed in love yeah. when it comes, to, uh, and therefore we're very heavily involved in our addictions. Yeah. But uh, the first one, yeah, the emotional one, the spirits are often very heavily involved in that yeah. because every time we have an emotional openness to having something be fed, there is a spirit who wants to feed that addiction as long as we're willing to give them something in return. So, mm. it's, so it's just the same kind of relationship as we have developed with other people on earth, with the exception we just can't see the person who's supplying the emotion. Yeah. That's the only exception. Yeah. The second thing with physical in, in situations, often spirits after they've passed no longer can have the same physical situations. Yeah. And so they, they visit people on earth and encourage them to engage in the same physical situation so that they can have the same experience yes. emotionally. Yeah. So, you know, they often are involved in that. And then spirits are heavily involved in substance abuse. Mm -hmm. The main reason why is because they can't get those substances in the spirit world. Yeah. And so what they do is they overcloak a person on earth who's willing to imbibe these substances to the point where, where they can share the results of the substances with another person. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the poor person on earth will finish up passing out even and yet the spirit will still be able to feel the results of the substance through connecting energetically to the person. Yeah. So spirits are heavily involved in all three aspects of our addictions. And uh, what I was meaning to say earlier was that these, this is not all spirits globally, it's just spirits who wish to engage addictions themselves so of course. they haven't progressed very far after they've passed. Yeah, which is so. a good 21 billion spirits yes. or so. Yeah, yes, so there's still a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. yes, so yes. there's a lot, there's three times the amount of people than the amount of people on earth, spirits who wish to engage in these activities. Absolutely. So, so at the end of the day, um, yeah, you, you know, it's highly unlikely that a person experiencing one of these addictions doesn't have at least one 
spirit with them who's mm -hmm. also encouraging them to meet these addictions. To meet the addictions. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So basically, uh, addictions are there. We rely on them in order to suppress uh, our painful emotions. Our painful emotions, fear, grief, yeah. shame. And it's not just suppress, it's in a way of denying Sorry. that we even have one. Yes. It's a way of resisting the feeling of one. Yes. It's a way of suppressing the feeling of one or it's a way of substituting the feeling of one. So, you know, sometimes our grief is so strong and we know it's there, but we want to have a more pleasurable feeling. So, yeah. so we'd go and get drunk instead. Yes. Uh, you know, we know we're sad, but we just don't want to feel it. Uh -huh. And so we're conscious, we're not in denial, we're not in resistance of the emotion because we find it's too hard to resist anymore. Yeah. And we're trying to suppress it, but, it's, uh, but we find the only thing is substitution yes. that works. So we could be doing any of those four techniques. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, great. No worries. <laughs> How are addictions created? Well, ad addictions are created by the desire to do one of four things with our painful emotions, and in particular with the painful emotion of fear. Uh -huh. And those four things are firstly to deny fear exists, to suppress the feeling of the fear, to resist the feeling of the fear, or to substitute other feelings for the feeling of the fear, in place of the feeling of the fear. And if we desire to do any of those four things, we will create addictions automatically. <laughs> so our addictions are generally automatically created without much thought, uh -huh. as soon as we enter the state where we deny, suppress, resist, or want to substitute. Yep. So that's the primary way in which all of our addictions are created. Yeah. Great. Pretty concise. It is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a few notes here. Of course. We, yeah. we need to, of course, see the circumstances under which they might be created. Yeah. So yeah. that's why we've created some extra notes for people to understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would you like me to... Yes, let's list them one by one yep. and, uh, and then we'll discuss them. So... We're attempting to deny, resist or suppress grief by replacing real love with emotions masquerading as love. Yes. So this refers back to, you remember there is a direct relationship between fear and, and how fear is created and addictions and how addictions are created. So remember if we go back to the, uh, the fear and how fear was created, we firstly had the withdrawal of love, the withdrawal of truth, the emotions, the, the, the um, addictions masquerading as love mm -hmm. and the lies masquerading as truth. Yes. So naturally there is going to be a link now between the way fear is created and, and how addictions are created. Because mm -hmm. addictions are created by the suppression or the attempts to suppress, deny, resist or place something in lieu of your fear. Yeah. So of course there's going to be a direct re relationship between how fear is created and how addictions are created. Yes. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So in this first particular one we're looking at the lies masquerading as love. Yes. Aren't we? So, so whenever there are lies masquerading as, oh, sorry, uh, addictions masquerading as love, what, what happens there is that we, we think we're being loving Mm -hmm. And we desperately want that type of love, right. right? A feeling of love coming from somebody, uh -huh. but it's a misinterpretation of what real love is. So, so in other words, we think it's love, yep. but because of our childhood uh, things that happened due to fear, we we are wrong. Uh -huh. We we actually believe that it's love, but it's not. Yep. It's actually an addiction that was was getting met, and and we only think that somebody loves us when they uh, have some kind of addiction with us. Okay, so you're saying when, when I have a lie, uh, a codependent or an addiction, addiction yeah. that I believe is love, yes. fear is created, yes. and then I can act to suppress the fear, the fear and the... By wanting more of that codependent addiction. Got you. So, yep. so, so in other words, I'm screaming for, you know, yep. I, I'm, I'm desperately wanting somebody to give me that feeling that I interpret as love. Yeah. 
because the emotion in me causes me to interpret as love. Yeah. So somebody comes along and tells you that's not loving and you go, don't be stupid, I know what love is and that's love. Yeah. <laughs> Even though you're completely wrong yeah. because you have the emotion inside of you that's causing you to interpret that as love. Yeah. Right? And that's the trouble with uh, addictions masquerading as love in our childhood mm. is that it causes this layer of fear that then have, the, have these addictions that are created that all want the addiction to be met so that you can feel like you're loved. Is that because without that addiction you feel zero love whatsoever? Correct. Somebody can even be loving you and yet you feel a zero love from them mm -hmm. because they are not meeting your addiction. Yeah. Now, what I notice is this about a lot of spiritual people. Yes. They are experts at meeting people's addictions, mm. right? That's can we call them spiritual in that way? No, they're not yeah. true. It's not true spirituality. But the so-called, you know, new age spiritual people who are, who are lovely people and are leaders in the in the field, yes. they are experts at meeting people's addictions. Yeah. Now this is very very damaging, because basically it's lies. It's it's addictions masquerading as love. So the people like it because in their childhood, that's what they had as love. Mm -hmm. They had all of these addictions masquerading as love. Yeah. And so now as an adult, that's what they seek. Yeah. They seek people who act the same way as their parents acted when they felt a loving, which is really just a codependent addiction feeling from their parent. Yeah. And it's so sad to watch. And, and ironically, the opposite also occurs with me. So, so when people come along to me, they say, I don't feel much love coming out of you. Mm. I'm not meeting any of your addictions that you believe are loving to meet yeah. and when I don't meet them you think I'm being nasty to you when I'm <laughs> actually not <laughs> I mean I'm being loving to you in that place from God's perspective but you think I'm being nasty because I'm not meeting your addictions mm. yeah. yes I have I've got you got hundreds got of processes going, going on there process <laughs> going on in my head that I can't get out yeah um but yeah Absolutely. I witness that all the time. Yeah. And I also know that um, it requires us becoming more sensitive emotionally to really sense love, to get beyond some addictions, yeah. to really sense it. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, let's move on to the next one. Yes, yes. So let's cover all four and then if we want to discuss yeah. more, then we'll discuss yep. more. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay, so the second one is... And so remember, we're talking about how addictions are created here. Right. Yep. Yep. So they're created when we are attempting mm -hmm. to deny, resist or suppress fear by substituting other emotions which are temporarily more powerful. Yes. So in the first example, it was about grief and love. Yes. And now we're talking <coughs> about fear and other emotions. Yes. So these are all, and by the way, these examples are not exhaustive. You know, there's yeah. many things that can cre create our uh, addictions. But mm -hmm. what we need to do is just help people start to analyse what's going on here yeah. uh, rather than give an exhaustive answer yeah. about the question. But if we look at this particular issue, our desire to suppress creates the addiction. Mm -hmm. So, so it, remember, it's the desire to express, suppress the pain. Now, if the pain is sadness and we don't want to feel it, we will create an addiction. Now, the only reason why we wouldn't want to feel it is because we're afraid of feeling it, probably. So it's probably another layer on top. So this is why we often have sadness. And then a layer over the layer of sadness is fear. And then we don't want to fear, we fear our sadness. So we've got now fear of sadness. And then, of course, suppression of the fear causes us to want the addiction, right? So our desire to suppress any emotion is going to create automatically an addiction. Mm -hmm. And that is an automatic creation. Yeah. It's not something that you'll even be conscious of. It's an automatic creation of the, from the desire to suppress. Yes. And this is the, the thing we need to understand that just having a desire to suppress, mm -hmm. a desire to deny, a desire to resist, or a desire to substitute is going to automatically cause us to substitute. Yeah. <laughs> it's just going to happen automatically yeah. without us even being aware most of the time yeah. that it's happening. And unfortunately, 
because of that we won't even be aware that we're doing it mm -hmm. and most people are completely unaware when they are actually doing it completely unaware and it's only once you've released most of your own addictions that you see it happening everywhere it's like a it's like this disease <laughs> or virus that people have and you see it's happening everywhere and nobody knows because it's all a part of their normal day-to-day -day life in terms of helping them to do one of those four things with their painful emotions. Yeah, you and I is it, have joked in the past about um, the the current trend towards zombie movies. Yes, yes, and yes. And how yes. what is that metaphorically um, uh, demonstrating about everyone wanting to suppress and deny so much that they become zombie-like, and yeah. that's happening all around us anyway. Yeah. And and yet they're terrified of zombies. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not so terrified that they don't want to make a lot no, of movies no, about no, it. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's quite interesting uh, what's made movie-wise because oftentimes it is all an expression of what is being suppressed emotionally in the crowd. Yeah. And that's why it has certain, you know, people examining it, you know, and they're drawn to it more yeah. fully. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Anyway. Mm. Okay. So we talked about suppressing fear yep. and substituting other emotions. Yep. So the first one is suppression of grief, the desire to suppress grief. So grief is a painful emotion mm -hmm. for most people. And for most people, they view it as too painful to feel. Yep. And, and I suppose you could say shame also feels that, but that is a fear-based emotion. Mm -hmm. So suppression of fear is, fear is usually another emotion. And remember fear ranging from even slight anxiety, most people are not wanting to feel. Yeah. But absolute terror, most people have no desire to feel that whatsoever, of course. And so there are huge desires coming out of them to suppress the feeling, hence the attraction to the addictions. Yes, yeah. yes. If you have a desire to do the opposite, you won't create many addictions at all. Mm. And you won't have many addictions automatically. That's the irony. Mm. But once you have the addictions, very hard to get rid of them because the desire to suppress is present. And that's the problem. The desire to substitute is present. The desire to resist is present. The desire to deny is present. So you're going to have to, if you have any addictions at all, you're going to have to work on the desires that you have in your soul's will to deny, to resist, yes. to suppress, to substitute. It's not enough to simply stop doing the physical action. Or no, the, you won't be able to. It, it, you, it will mutate <laughs> into another into addiction. Another form. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 It, it, while the desire in you to suppress the underlying cause of emotion remains, addictions are the necessary result inside of you. Mm -hmm. They're the thing you have to do mm -hmm. in order to help you avoid the painful experience. Yeah. And, and so you will do it. And it doesn't matter how much you think you won't, you will. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. ain't that the truth. Mm. Okay, um, so the third example you were talking about denying, resisting or suppressing anger by substituting other emotions that are temporarily more powerful. Yes, now here I'm speaking not of adult anger, which we'll discuss in a different question. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking of the childhood anger that was created due to the suppression of the grief and fear that are caused by your environment at the time. So, mm -hmm. so see a lot of children are firstly told they're not allowed to feel their sadness Otherwise, they'll give, be given something to feel sad about. Mm -hmm. Which creates fear. Which creates fear. Yeah. And then when they feel afraid and they act on their fear, the parent goes, what are you afraid of? You've got nothing to be afraid of. And they're angry with the child and threaten violence towards them generally. Mm -hmm. So now the child is now afraid to express their fear. So now they have to put another layer on that. Now, if they can't get their addiction met to suppress their fear in that place as a child, they revert to anger or rebellion. Mm -hmm. Now, usually most children have that heavily suppressed mm -hmm. because they start to experience anger and then the parents do give them something to be, to be sad about mm. by belting them or being violent towards them. Mm -hmm. So that causes the child to learn how to suppress rage and anger at the childhood level. Yeah. Now that, of course, they, they then have huge amounts of fear associated with anger with the expression of childhood anger, childlike anger. Not, n not a different type of anger, which we'll talk about next, which is the anger that most people also have uh -huh. and engage in all the time. Yeah. 
but rather the anger associated with the suppressed childhood experience as a child. Yeah. Now, as a result of trying to get away from that, you yeah. will enter addictions. Yeah. Yeah. And those addictions will be one of those three forms of addictions, which will be emotional, physical or substance related generally. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The fourth, the fourth <coughs> example is attempting to deny, resist or suppress truth with lies masquerading as truth. Yes. Now this, uh, this, a lot of the world is addicted to this. Yep. The way to stay away from emotion is to deny the truth about the emotion. So the, the way to feel an emotion at the causal level is to accept the truth about the emotion. And the way to stay away from the emotion is to deny the truth about the emotion. Mm -hmm. So lies masquerading as truth become very acceptable emotionally to us. Mm -hmm. So we want to hear the lies masquerading as truth rather than hear the truth itself. The truth itself will expose the underlying causal emotion. We don't want that. Mm -hmm. So what we choose to do is accept a whole heap of lies masquerading as truth. Uh, we can give some examples here. For example, most people, when you tell them that their parents didn't love them, they'll say that's a lie. Mm. They'll say, my parents loved me. And then you ask them, did your parents smack you? They go, yes, but they love me. There's the lie masquerading as truth. Yeah. Vi a violent parent doesn't prove love. It proves violence. It proves there was no love in that moment, right? Yeah. There's the lie masquerading as truth. But we want to tell ourselves the lie that our parents loved us so that we don't have to feel the truth that they did not. Mm -hmm. And we'd prefer to accept this lie. And as a society, we prefer to accept the lie. And also as individuals, we prefer to accept the lie. Yeah. So this is an example of a lie masquerading as truth that we use to suppress our underlying causal emotion. Yeah. 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 And that is always going to result in an addiction. Yeah. We're going to want somebody to tell us the lies, to feed us the lies. See, inside, there's a feeling inside that none of the lies are real. You know, they're not true. Yeah. But, but so, so we want the lie to be told over and over again. So we want mummy and daddy to tell us they love us all the time yeah. when we don't feel they love us at all. Yes, and this, this was the half-formed question I had earlier. Mm -hmm. And that was when we have um, a situation in our childhood where lies masqueraded as truth mm -hmm. or where addiction masqueraded as love, um, don't we somewhere internally have a sense of the lie? Um, not always, no. Not always. It depends when the, it was created. So, you know, this is the problem is that if, they were, if these lies were created during our formative years when we had very little logical intellect, then it's highly unlikely we will know. In what fact, about as we open up emotionally ourselves and then we will sensitive? Know. Right. But it requires sensitivity. Yes. And it requires us to be sensitive to our pain. Yep. And most people aren't. Yep. So, so while most people are desensitised to their pain, they will not know mm -hmm. that, it, that it was unloving or loving, in fact, either one. Mm -hmm. And they will think things were loving when they weren't. They'll think things were unloving when they weren't, yep. you know, because they're not sensitive to the truth. To be sensitive to the truth of any situation, you have to be sensitive emotionally. Yeah. And you have to be sensitive not to the addictive emotions, but rather to the causal emotions. And the majority of people are only sensitive to their addictive emotions. So it's very, very hard when you're only sensitive to your addictive emotions for you to determine what the truth is. Yeah. And therefore you won't feel something was true. Mm. You will believe with all your heart that the opposite was true when it was not. And it's only by someone being in your face, logical, with you going, no, it can't be the truth, that can't be right, that can't be right, until you go, oh, maybe it's not right. Uh, usually before you'll come to accept the, the real truth, God's truth about the situation. Yeah. yeah. So it's sad, it's sad what happens to us in that childhood formative experience because we, we finish up believing lies are true, we finish up believing truths are lies, we finish up believing love is addiction, we finish up believing addiction is love, we finish up believing that something that's really love is not love at all. You know, we come, we come away from the experience with so many false beliefs that we now have to, as an adult, be willing to unravel. Now, God's willing to help us unravel all of these things, mm -hmm. but it's just whether we're willing to go through the painful emotional experience 
and for the majority of people they aren't mm. willing to go through the painful emotional experience and so they never unravel it even though they hear truth over and over again for many years they still won't unravel it until they're willing to go through the painful emotional experience yeah. and that's how the human soul functions yes. until we're willing to get rid of the resistance emotionally within our soul to accepting truth we will not accept the truth no matter how much we tell it mm -hmm. to ourselves and to others mm -hmm. we just won't accept it and that that's what dominance does in the soul yeah. so we need to understand the principles of how the soul functions to really understand how to unravel all of this mess that's been created <laughs> in our soul. Yeah. But really the primary creator of the mess is just our unwillingness to feel pain. That's the primary creator of the mess. And once you understand that, it becomes very simple to unravel the mess. Yeah. You need to learn how to be willing to feel your pain. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the main thing that you need to learn, in fact. Mm. Yeah. So it is quite simple to unravel once you understand that. But unfortunately for most people, there's a deep unwillingness to feel any pain at all. And as a result, you know, we, we revert to addictions and so forth to avoid them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Mm. What is anger? Well, before I answer this question, I'd probably like to say that there are two types of it. Mm -hmm. and, and one type is related to our childhood and the other type is related to most of what we're going to speak about next. Sure. <laughs> most people's anger has nothing to do with their childhood anger, unfortunately. Most people's anger has a lot to do with what they want to express as an adult for reasons that they have as an adult to, su to suppress their fear. Uh -huh. So we need to firstly see that a childhood anger expression is going to be very, very different to an adult anger expression. Yeah. Childhood anger expression is generally not projected at anyone else. It, it, it doesn't blame the world or the universe for it. It feels the pain of the hurt and the resistance, its own resistance to the pain of the hurt that's within. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of anger some people have mm -hmm. to feel. Um, and I say some people because, uh, you know, obviously sometimes we were, we got so goaded as children that we started to get angry and then that was also suppressed so obviously it's an emotion that we have to feel as adults as, then a, we have to as let adults we have to yeah. connect to that childhood expression of the anger but when we do connect to that childhood expression of the anger we will not be projecting it upon anyone mm -hmm. we will not be yelling and screaming at somebody mm -hmm. we'll be feeling it internally and and expressing it to ourselves generally so it's very, very different to the type of anger that we're now going to talk about, <laughs> which is the most common anger yeah. that everybody has. Can I just clarify, you said we'll be expressing it to ourselves. You don't necessarily mean towards ourselves, no, do you? You I mean, mean just in, a, in an, an environment, environment where we ourselves are alone yeah. and where we feel the pain of our own resistance. Yeah which is very, very different than blaming everybody else for, for, for things, which is what most people's anger is for. Yeah. And also um, we start to recognise as a child that it was, a, a desire, it was our desire to feel powerful in very powerless situations. Yeah. And we allow ourselves to feel the grief associated with that kind of anger. And you'll, you'll feel the age of the anger too under those circumstances. So if the anger was created when you were five, you will feel like you're five years old going through it. Mm. And, and you won't be expressing it to people because it, uh, the reality is as a child, you didn't express it to people. So, so you know, that's the reason why it was suppressed because yeah. you didn't express it. Yeah. So the reality is you won't be projecting it at other people because you never would have chosen to do such a thing as a child. Yeah. So, you know, so you'll just feel it mm. and feel the pain of it. And that's not the anger that we're now going to speak of. Okay, so okay. let's speak of this. <laughs> this is the... the most common form of anger. This is the most common form yep. of anger that we're now going to speak of. Mm -hmm. The most common form of anger is a desire to, to have, sorry, uh, it's an unmet desire to have your addictions met. So, so maybe so I'll it, can it we, arises. Can we say that again? Yeah, it's yeah. probably yeah, not yeah. the right thing to say. It arises yeah. because you have not met your addictions. Yeah. In other words, the average person creates a whole set of addictions which are all about denying, suppressing, um, resisting or substituting their hard childhood emotions, their, yeah. their causal emotions, their painful emotions, mm 
uh, so they wanted to suppress and deny all of those things. So what they do is they create a whole layer of addictions. Yeah. When their addictions are no longer met by their environment or by the substance or by the physical act, yeah. they revert to rank anger and rage. Mm -hmm. Now, anger ranges from, it, it's a stored energy, yeah. so, right? It's an energy that yeah. can be stored or expressed. In motion, yeah. When it's in motion, when it becomes an emotion, it will be expressed as slight, ignore, slight annoyance right the way through to extreme violent rage. Yeah. Right? It can be any of It can be anything in, in between that yeah. range. Yeah. So if, whenever we talk about anger, we are talking about a group of emotions, not just a single emotion. Yeah and a group of emotions ranging from just a tiny little bit of annoyance right the way through to extreme rage. And, and the other thing about this anger, if you like, is that, it, is that it is a desire to feel certain things that cause it. So, so it's not only just a desire to get your addictions met, uh -huh. but rather a desire when your addictions aren't met to get them met. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? So, sure. so, it's so, it's so initially when we want our addictions met, we're quite gentle with it all. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? We, we generally, you know, we're gentle with the people around us, we're gentle with the substances, we go, oh, that feels nice, and we have a bit more of that. Yeah. But, but after a while, it becomes non-satisfying, or if it ever does become unsatisfying, we are no longer satisfied in having our addictions met that way. It's not enough for us. Mm -hmm. and, and when it's not enough for us, now we revert to the anger-based feeling. The anger-based feeling gives us a lot of things, which we'll go through. I think we've listed four things that it gives us that, that we'll, we'll need to go through yeah, one Yeah, or one. really why we use it. Correct. What, we, what, what we're we attempting it. to do by what we're attempting getting to get, angry. Yeah, yeah, when we get angry, yes. So, so we need to understand these particular things about anger. And this is the kind of anger that is completely out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with our childhood experience at all. In mm -hmm. fact, it's quite the opposite. It's the denial of our childhood experience that causes this kind of anger. Yeah. So we're trying as hard as we can to deny what we experience or need to, that we, the experience we locked up as a child. Yeah. And so we revert to this kind of anger instead. So this is, that's very important what you just said. So the expression of this kind of anger does the opposite of helping our soul to grow. Correct. It, does, right. it damages our soul yeah. and it damages the souls of others. And particularly if we become violent with it, it's extremely damaging to our soul and the, and the souls of others. Okay, so, so uh, can I clarify that a bit more? Sure. Because um, obviously you've said this kind of anger can be stored also. It can be stored. Or it can be in motion. It can be in motion. And expressed. Yes. yes. So, but when we're expressing this kind of anger, we're actually heading away from any kind of causal emotion. We're, try, we're actively trying to suppress our childhood experience. We're using this kind of anger as a tool to yep. suppress causal emotions which will help us heal. Yeah. So it's, it's, not, it's not even, there's of no, it's of no benefit to us to even experience this kind of anger. Okay. There's, there's no single benefit to even experience it, really. Yeah. Yeah. We need to find what's under it. Now, sometimes when you experience it, you will find what's under it. Yeah. But, but you need to experience it in a very, very controlled environment like if you're ever going to not damage yourself or other people. Mm -hmm. And this is where you need to be completely alone experiencing this kind of anger. Otherwise, you are definitely going to damage yourself and other people. Right? And even if you're alone, there are times when you are damaging other people with it. Yeah. So particularly if they are open to the absorption of the emotion, then you're definitely damaging other people with it, even if you're alone. Mm. So I know that later on in this series, we're going to ask, we've got questions from people yes. who uh, that and, speak to that. Yes. So. And we need to also say that it, this kind of anger is the result of denial. It's yes. the result of suppression. It's the result of resistance. It's the result of a substitution. We want the substitute. Mm -hmm for the harder emotion. And so it's all about using our will to get the substitute. Yeah. So it's got nothing to do with using our will in harmony with love anymore. Yeah. It's got everything to do with using our will to get the substitute done, to, mm -hmm. to get the effect we want. Yeah. Right? And that is completely out of harmony with love. So that's going to damage our soul every time we engage it. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about what we're trying to do with yes. this kind of anger. Yes. So the first thing is, 
to control or manipulate the environment back into supporting our addictions. Correct, so that's the primary reason why we revert to this kind of anger. We want whatever is happening in our environment to go back to the way it was. <laughs> yeah, because that's where addictions were being met and we felt further distanced from... From the true causal emotion that we need to feel. Yep. So, so we're using anger as a tool to change our environment mm -hmm. back to the condition that's unloving. Yeah. So and actually we're trying to force our environment to become more unloving to suit our addiction. Yeah. And this is why it's damaging because it's, it's trying to force other people or things in our environment to meet our own unloving state. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very unloving choice. It is. Yep. And in prior discussions today, you've talked about how God's laws are operating to help expose what is suppressed within us mm -hmm. and we're acting in addiction to suppress it further mm -hmm. rather than have it exposed yes and then when we act in this anger we're even acting further out of harmony with god's laws aren't we Correct. we're saying we're now resorting to violence yeah because even if it's emotional it's still violence you're you're trying to force the environment some, something or someone in the environment to go back to their old behaviour. Mm -hmm. That's not honouring free will at all. Mm -hmm. It's not honouring the free will of people in your environment. And it's also not honouring the fact that actually they're more loving to you when they don't do that. So, so it, it's not honouring love at all. Yes. It's not honouring truth at all. Yeah. In fact, it's in complete denial of love, truth, and also complete denial of a person's free will. It's, it's, the, it's the result of you not wanting to take personal responsibility for what's inside of you. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, very damaging course of action. And most people resort to it because it, it's, it gets their environment because it go back to what it was before. Yeah. And, and it's very, very damaging action. Yeah. Very damaging action. One of the most damaging things you can do to your soul is to resort to that kind of anger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, to control or manipulate the environment back into supporting our addictions? Yes. Yep. So that's number one. Number one. Yep. Number two, to punish our environment for not supporting our addictions. Yes, this is even darker again. Yeah. Because basically what we're saying to our environment is we're saying, you're not doing what I want you to do. So now what I'm going to do is, not only am I going to force you to do what I want you to do, but I'm going to hurt you for not doing it. Yeah. So this is like wanting to punish or hurt, harm somebody because they didn't meet your addictions. Yes. And that's a very damaging course of actions. It's, it's not very far from that, that most people, the, the reason why most people who die and pass, pass into the hells of the spirit world is because they frequently have this emotion. Mm -hmm. This emotion that they feel completely willing to punish other people mm -hmm. for what those other people didn't do or should have done for them. Yeah. 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 And, and it's a very, very damaging course of action to take for your own soul and for another, towards another. And so some some real life examples of this might be um, a parent belting a child yes. or a person. So a parent resorting to violence. Yep. Uh, just because the child didn't do something the parent wanted. Yep. Yes. And it's a punishment rather than just a rather yelling match to get them to do what they want. Yeah. which might be the first form of anger. Correct. The second form is taking it beyond that to actually physically harming. Harming the child. Yep. Yep. And creating violence towards the child yep. from a physical perspective as well as an emotional one. Yep. So the first level, you could say, that we yep. went through creates emotional violence. Mm -hmm. The second level is re willing to resort to physical violence generally. Yep. Yep. It's a desire to punish another person. It's a desire to make their life hard, make their life difficult. Mm -hmm. to make their life more difficult than it currently is. As soon as you have that emotion, you're way out of harmony with love yeah. at that point. And so um, in the context of, say, a relationship, mm -hmm. when um, I have a codependent addiction mm -hmm. that you've been meeting for me... Yes, so let's say, you know, I make you feel safe and secure. Safe and secure. We get in a situation where I no longer feel safe and secure. So let's say I lost my job. Yep. 
lost your job. And so we're not going to regular income anymore. You no longer feel safe I and feel secure. Terrible. I don't want to feel terribly afraid. Mm -hmm. My addiction to feeling safe and secure that was met by you and your job is no longer there. Yeah. So, so, I don't, I, so you start projecting in me that I've got to go and get a job. Yeah, get a job, hurry up. Every every morning before, you know, at 7am, I'm yelling at you. Or even just on. doing the manipulative thing. For example, yeah. just going, you know, oh, I've got to get you up. You know, why don't you go out today? Why don't you, you know, making all these suggestions. Yeah. And it's, you're not making them for my sake. You're making yeah. them for your own. Yeah. You, you're making them to, so, so that you don't have to feel certain things. Yeah. Which is selfish. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So that would be a, that would be an example of the first of the first type of, type anger. of anger. So whether it's overt or covert, it there's doesn't a matter even if it's covert. It's like, oh, I'll make on. you ready and I'll get you ready and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Good on you. Off That's you all go. covert rage. Covert rage. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and then, if, but if it was to take it to the second level mm -hmm. of punishing, then after three months and you still haven't got a job, I might resort to going. Well, you useless. The problem is you are lazy. The problem is you and trying to then attack your character or nature or attack what my situation personally. Yes, that would be an example of punishing. That'd be a, you're now trying to punish the person for no longer allaying your fear. So that's when we get into a darker state with this much anger. darker state with the anger now. Gotcha. So it might not have resorted to anything physical. But you know, you're now in a violent state with this anger and you're now quite, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? It's probably, you're, you're now use, not only using emotional manipulation techniques now, you're using outright attack now yes. to try and manipulate the person into changing their behaviour. Yeah. Right, so that, that's very, very damaging now. You, you, and you might, you, you know, you'd be saying probably at that stage, you'd be saying very cutting things, you'd try to be humiliating. And if you don't resort to physical violence, you'll come close at times. Mm, mm. Mm, you'll okay. yell and scream and you throw things and whatever. Yeah, mm. so that's, thank you for clarifying that. I wanted to make it clear that we can punish without physical violence, can't we? Certainly, yeah. certainly. Yeah. You can even do things like, oh, stuff this, I'm going to go and have sex with somebody else who makes me feel safe. Wow, well, yeah. Right? Which means you've said nothing to the person that made you feel unsafe and you've got no idea inside of you why you went and had sex with somebody else, but you felt drawn to do so just because that person made you feel safe somehow and you felt sexually attracted to them as a result. Mm -hmm. And that is an act of rage. An act of rage and addiction on your part. And addiction on your part, yeah. 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 Very damaging actions. And, and, you know, if you examine society in the world, you, you see this happening all the time every day, <laughs> in these kind of actions. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. And we don't call it anger necessarily. No, we don't. We, we often call it, you know, completely different things. Oh, that person's looking after themselves now. Or, oh, that person's got some self-worth now. No. Wow. <laughs> Oftentimes yeah. they're just enraged and they, they are using passive aggressive or aggressive ways to, to, to manipulate their environment to get back their addictions. Mm. Yeah. Okay, third type third of type. anger. We blame our environment for not supporting our addictions. Yes, what this is, is a bit like? different to punishment yep. in the sense that we're basically saying our environment is responsible for the reason why we're not having our addictions met. In other words, we're not seeing it as a personal responsibility even for our own addictions to be met by ourselves. Yep. We think the environment is responsible for our addictions to be met and our environment is also responsible for to help us suppress our deeper emotions. Uh -huh. And, and so we blame externally. We, we blame everyone else other than ourselves. In other words, we no longer take personal responsibility for any of our own feelings about what is happening. Right. Uh, and that, that is an external blame of other people, of other things, in order to avoid taking personal responsibility. So what would an example of that be? Um, what, blaming the government, blaming the train system, blaming the... the is oh, I had, in the previous the, example, yeah. I had sex with him because he's attractive. There's a blame of your environment. Had nothing to do with the fact that he was attractive. It had everything to do with the fact that you didn't feel safe. Right, <laughs> right. So, so, so you're blaming the environment for the action you took, having sex with somebody who's not your marriage partner. Yeah. Right. You're yeah, blaming you know, it on something that you think, you know, he was attractive and that's why I did it when it had nothing to do with why you did it. Yeah. It, the reason why you did it was because you were in denial of certain emotions 
in particular emotions of safety and security, and he made you feel safe and secure, so you had sex with him. Yeah. You know. So it's almost like um, a bit of misdirection. It's a it's a bit of saying. Uh, it's I'm a way to avoid personal responsibility. Yeah. Every time. I'm a victim of this circumstance, Correct. whatever it is. Yeah, we, we portray ourselves as victims of the circumstance and we're not to blame for our actions. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> yes. So I'm punishing you right now and I'm also being manipulative right now, but I'm not to blame for my actions. It's because you did something. Mm. And again, this is very dark, isn't it? Very dark behaviour. Yeah. Yeah. Very dark behaviour. Any person who engages in that behaviour will, will be in the hells of the spirit world. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doesn't matter what they, their face portrays or yeah. you know anything else. They will arrive in the hells of the spirit world yeah. if they pass right in it, right at that point. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, fourth time yep. for anger. Yep. Um, it's when we use anger to feel powerful and avoid feeling weak. Yes, and um, this is a very common use of anger, right? The use of anger to avoid the powerless emotions. Yep. So powerless emotions are emotions like fear and terror and you know sadness and grief. They are emotions where we don't feel powerful anymore. We don't feel like we're in control anymore. We don't feel like we've got our self-determination anymore. And so what we do is we re revert to rage or anger in order to feel powerful and feel like we have control again. Yeah. And sometimes we're even angry at ourselves or angry at other people in that state. It doesn't yeah. really matter as long as we feel powerful in that state. Does that make yeah. sense? And when we feel powerful, we get to avoid all the powerless emotions. Right? Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why we revert to anger as well, to, in order to feel the power of it. Because anger is a very a strong emotion. And often we do very strong things when we're angry. Yeah. Um, whereas when we see, think of emotions like fear or sadness, we don't see them as strong emotions. We see them as weak emotions generally. Society sees them as weak emotions generally. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, reverting to a strong emotion so we can avoid the appearance of having a weak one is a very common reason for why people get angry. Yeah. And men in particular do this because yeah. men are told that when they're you know, afraid or sad, they're weak. And so what they do is they often revert to anger in order to feel powerful and to demonstrate their power. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's not true. You know, in fact, you're far less powerful angry than you were feeling a causal emotion from yeah. a soul perspective. Yeah. But, but most people don't, aren't aware of that, of course. So that, that is based on a lot of false beliefs that we have taken on in our childhood about the nature of emotion and what, what equates to feeling weak and strong and powerful and powerless. Yeah, well, let's be more correct. Yeah. It's a, it equates to the childhood beliefs that were forced upon us mm -hmm. by our environment because mm -hmm. it's highly unlikely we would have taken them on unless they were forced upon <laughs> us. Because <laughs> so. taking them on or having them forced upon us made us suppress huge parts of our experience, correct, didn't it? Correct, correct. Yeah. And also in our childhood experience, many of us have experienced deep uh, feelings of powerlessness and, and, and terror mm. uh, and fear and all sorts of emotions because of what happened as a child. And so, you know, as an adult, we're trying to avoid those feelings quite strongly. So we revert to a powerful emotion in order to avoid all of these weak, these emotions we judge as weak and insipid. Yeah. And, uh, and of course our environment taught us as a child, taught us that these emotions were weak and insipid, mm -hmm. you know, fear and, and sadness was weak and insipid. And so what we do, do is the direct result of these emotions, these feelings being forced upon us. We were taught it yeah. by our environment. It's not something that we would have naturally assumed yeah. without it being taught by somebody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the average child is very humble to their own emotions, particularly of grief. You know, most children within the first day of their life cry quite easily. Yes. And as a, it demonstrates how humble they are to the emotion of grief. That only changes because of the environment forced to change. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. So basically we've you've outlined four different types or and, and of course we could list more yep. i think you know it's very important for our listeners to see that we could have listed more but these give them some uh, ideas for themselves when they revert to this adult rage that they have mm -hmm. or anger that they have or annoyance that they have 
what's really going on inside of themselves is, is a lot of quite dark things going on inside of yourself when you revert to this behavior yeah. and you need to allow yourself to experience the anger still but as soon as you experience it using one of these four methods you are way out of line with experiencing it in harmony with any love yes. you can be angry and not sin that's that's yeah. the reality you yeah. can be angry and still be loving by experiencing your anger in harmony with love all of these ways that we've already listed are all out of harmony with love mm -hmm. they're all ways to control manipulate your environment blame your environment punish your environment or feel powerful and none of them work by the way no. none of them will get you to your causal emotion none of them will help you get closer to god so in a way they're all pointless experiences yeah. unless you're feeling your anger and actually doing it in a manner that's in harmony with love which is just feeling it so being responsible about the expression of it yes and understanding that there are a, you have it because you want some addictions met and being willing to go and find those addictions yeah. whatever they are to yeah. be willing to face them yeah. what are my addictions why do i get angry here yeah. you know so if you look at the average guy who gets jealous of his girlfriend he's angry because of something going on inside of him mm -hmm. right that's not he's not feeling safe in the relationship anymore that's why he's angry yeah so so it might be something where she isn't making him feel safe it, like it might be something where he is unsafe yes or it might be something where he isn't but he's just imagining he is yes it could be either but unless he if he allows himself to feel it without projecting all the crap on her yeah. then he'll find out oh no it's because i do feel this leakage of sexual energy from you to that person and that's what makes me feel unsafe and sure i've got to go and feel unsafe about that yeah. but i think you've got an issue with the leakage of sexual energy that you've <laughs> yeah. got to address yeah. if you want to have a relationship with me yeah. right yeah. so you can work through those particular issues as long as you're honest about feeling it you know and owning it yourself yeah if you if you in if the man in that state says right i'm going to get violent with you right if you're the woman and i'm the man in that state and i get violent with you to force you to um, you know to not be involved with that man or in any way then i am completely now in a very dark state with regard to my, the exercise of my anger mm. i'm not owning it i'm not feeling it i'm not looking at the reason why i have it i'm blaming you i'm trying to punish you for what i believe is your creation of my anger yeah and that's all out of harmony with self-responsibility all out of harmony with love yeah and and the anger itself is generated because we don't want to be responsible Correct. for what's already in us. Correct. Yep. The, the anger is coming from an addiction inside of us. Unless we're willing to find that addiction, we will revert to anger every time that addiction is not met. Yep. So we need to see that the anger is the direct result of our own desire to, to, to avoid our fears and our own desire to have our addictions met. Mm -hmm. And we need to see it as such. And we need to be willing at some point, if we ever want to be close to God or any, ever want to love, we need to be willing at some point to go, I want to see what the addiction is. I want to feel that addiction instead of getting angry all the time. I want to feel the fear that I have that's underneath that addiction. You know, I want to feel what's driving me towards this rage. And, and it's only then that the rage will dissipate. Yeah. The rage will dissipate when you're willing to feel the actual addiction itself and to feel the terror or fear that drives it mm -hmm. then you won't have any problem with the rage anymore yeah it'll be a, something that's rare in your life if it ever occurs at all yeah yeah yeah, yeah. thank you it's a great description and yeah. very comprehensive yeah. um explanation of the different damaging ways we frequently use anger and what i'm thinking about as you're speaking about that is that um we can do all these things control or manipulate punish blame feel powerful and avoid feeling weak mm. and it's not necessarily through a screaming rage sometimes it's a mild sense of what we call frustration but we are actually acting to control and punish and blame through that yeah you can even emotion. feel it as a pushiness yes emotional pushiness you you meet a lot of people who never revert to like overt rage who are Im terribly emotionally pushy they are they have huge amounts of anger in them mm. and and they are they have learned 
to not express their anger verbally or emotionally. They've learnt to become pushy emotionally, yeah. to try to force you emotionally. They become um, persistent people who just nag and nag and nag and nag. And mm -hmm. there's another expression of anger. Mm -hmm. So there's, there is so many passive aggressive ways to express anger that the majority of people learnt many ways because as a child they couldn't overtly express anger. They couldn't do it as it really felt, as they really felt it. So they learnt to do it in different ways. Yeah. They learnt it by becoming resistive, by manipulation, by control, by all sorts of other methods. But it's still anger. Yeah. It's still anger driving the behaviour. Yeah. Yeah. And at some point they're going to have to connect to that anger and feel it and feel what the addiction is driving it. Mm. Yeah. We see many people in that state. Like there are many people who come along to our sessions. After five years, they've not got beyond their anger. Mm -mm. And they believe they have. Mm -hmm. They believe they're no longer angry or whatever. And they're just highly manipulative individuals who have no desire to get into any of their addictions. Yeah. And, uh, and the more we tell them, the more enraged they become. And eventually they burst. <laughs> <laughs> and usually it's not pretty. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, because it usually it means that, you know, they harm a lot of people once that they burst. Yeah. They, many people have no idea how to experience anger in a way that doesn't sin. Yeah. You know, and, and the reason is because they don't want to take any responsibility was, for it. I was going to say, it's not like you haven't told us all how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just there's a desire lacking to do it. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it requires, a, again, a great deal of exercise of your will to experience your anger in a way that's in harmony with more love mm -hmm. than it does to do all of these other things we've been talking about. Yeah. And most people don't have that much desire to have their addictions confronted. Mm -hmm. They have a desire to have their addictions met, yeah. not confronted. Yeah. And hence, the anger is often the common way of you know reverting or getting the environment back to meeting your addictions yeah 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 so that's that's what anger is yes yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> and it's a such a damaging emotion it, it 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 as it in itself has is what is the most common emotion in the hells of the spirit world yeah anger and fear are yeah. the two most common emotions in the spirit world in, in the, the hells. hells yeah and, uh, and those two emotions uh, obviously rage from, you know, range from very, from slight annoyance to, and then slight you know, anxiety to, you know, to whatever it is, the yeah. other extreme Terror, yeah. in terms of fear and anger. But the reality is they are both very, very, very damaging emotions on this planet and also in the spirit world, mm. in, the, in the hells of the spirit mm. world. And they are very damaging emotions to the soul of an individual. Mm -hmm. And unless you're willing to feel them, you will never progress, yeah. ever. Yeah. And there are many people who have never progressed for thousands of years as a result of being resistive to truly feeling their anger or their fear rather than just reverting to their anger in order mm. to get their addictions met. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we've talked a lot about codependent addiction, haven't we? And um, it's almost sometimes we have it between us on earth, we have it between us and individual and spirits. spirits. But sometimes it feels to me like at the moment the earth and the lower spheres of the spirit world are in one huge, huge codependence. codependence. Mm. Yeah, where fear and anger is fostered yes. and, and, and honoured honored in yes. the lower realms. Yes. And, and I'll give you an example, earth. a few examples. You know, I think we mentioned a few in other FAQs, but you know, this, this whole thing that happened with World Vision. Yeah. Um, that's an example. Uh, World Vision wanted to change their rules to allow for married gay couples to work in their or, in organization. their organisation. Um, there was a huge amount of anger yeah. in the Christian community, which yeah. is all based on their own addictions. Yes. None of it's loving. Yeah. Doesn't matter what reason they give. Oh, the Bible says this or whatever. None of it's loving. Yeah. None of it's in harmony with love. Yeah. And the fear of the World Vision organisation was yeah. manipulated through this anger, which was the purpose of the people who were angry. Yep. There's an example of somebody who's going to arrive in the hells. Yeah. A Christian, will that Christian who did that, those yeah. Christians who did that, will arrive in the hells yeah. because they revert, have reverted to violence and manipulation in order to get what they want. Yeah. And they're willing to even see the death of children mm -hmm. in order to get what they want. Yeah. 
yeah. that's how strong their manipulation of their terror, you know, their, and their manipulation their, driven by their addiction was. Mm. Mm -hmm. So there's an example. Yeah. As an it's, example of how the world works. Yeah. We've had recent examples in our personal life with trying to get venues for yes. for, for us to do presentations in or, or assistance groups in. You see these examples all the time where yeah. compromises are constantly met based upon who's the person who's most angry. Yes. Now, yeah. if and we all base yeah. our life around the person who's most angry, there is not going to be any improvement in what happens on earth. No. At all. No. And, and if we do keep doing that in the spirit world, there'll be no improvement what happens in the spirit world either, yeah. in the lower spheres. Yeah. We have to learn to stop doing that. We have to learn to stop supporting anger, yeah. stop, start seeing anger as a desire in the individual to just have their addiction met yeah. and to refuse the meeting of that addiction. Yeah. We need to learn that. So, you know, these are all things we need to learn about anger. Mm. Mm. Thank you. How is anger created? Well, anger is created by the desire to avoid the, or sorry, the desire to have our addictions met so that we don't, can avoid certain other feelings. Yep. Basically, that's how anger is created. Yep. It's a desire to feel more powerful, desire to feel in control, desire to feel that we have our life in order uh -huh. and so forth. And when we don't have those feelings, we revert to rage in order to get our environment to conform back to our personal desires. Yeah. And so it's a desire also to manipulate the environment in some way. Mm -hmm. And this is why I say a lot of anger is actually very passive, like mm -hmm. passive aggressive. Even just a little tiny, you know, a little tiny resistance is often rage driving it. Yep. We're not allowed to express the rage, so what we do is we just be resistive. And that's a way of expressing our anger and displeasure about our environment not meeting our addictions anymore. Yeah. And uh, it's obviously very damaging to do such things to our soul. So basically, you're saying when our addictions aren't met and we have the desire for them to still be met, mm -hmm. we can get angry. But... Does everyone who stops having their addictions being met, do they, or, or, and still want them to be met, do they always resort to anger? Yes. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's the only cause of action unless you're willing to see your addictions. Yes. So, so you have two options basically whenever you have addictions not being met. You, you can feel that you have the addiction, mm -hmm. and that would, that would mean then that you wouldn't get angry at all. Yes. By the time you've gotten to the angry, angry stage, you've already demonstrated you have no desire to know what the addiction is. Yes. Right, so, so the anger is really demonstrating the lack of desire for the addiction. So everyone's going to get angry, but they might express that or display that or behave in different ways. Correct. In order to get the addiction met again, but... Correct. So they'll be, they'll be they angry. might be manipulative, they might be verbally or emotionally manipulative, they might be passive aggressive, they might be absolutely aggressive, mm -hmm. they might be in a rage, they might resort to violence. Yep. There's a whole range of behaviour that we resort to in our anger yep. in order to go back to getting our addictions met. Yep. But it's all angry. The whole lot's angry. Yeah, it's just a group of angry emotions <laughs> driving the whole thing. We can even internalise the anger, can't we, and punish ourselves in we an effort can, to but manipulate it's, others? Yes, but yeah. it's always got a purpose of manipulation of others. Yes. It's, got, it's, it's very, very rare that we revert to self-punishment without there being a motivation of manipulating others. Yeah. So, in fact, I, I, I don't, I've never really seen too many people resort to that place. Mm -hmm. you know, most people who resort to self-punishment are generally always attempting to manipulate somebody else through it. Mm -hmm. the, there, are f there might be a few exceptions to that, but, but generally that's the case. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Yep. Okay. Yep. So I think here we've also raised three issues that we'd like to discuss with people about what it does and we've covered this also in the what is anger section to a degree yeah but but if we look at some of the purposes of the anger sure. like of i suppose the reasons why we want to create it yeah so 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 we've looked at how it's created it's created because we want our addictions met and they're not being met so we decide we've decided internally that they need to be met they should be met and that it's somebody else's responsibility to meet them 
or yep. something else's responsibility to meet them. And so we so, choose to engage <laughs> our rage as a result. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's a choice. It's yep. a free will choice we're making. We're, we're actually, it's actually a choice made by our soul and driven generally by our intellect to, to happen. We, we, know it's, we know it at the time too. That's mm -hmm. the sad thing. Most people who revert to rage know they're being angry and they know they're doing it to manipulate. Yeah. <laughs> To try to force the environment back, back. into a state that they feel comfortable in. Again. Yeah, back to comfort, back to yeah. meeting their addictions. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we most of the time know that's what we're trying to do. Mm. Yeah. Maybe I could read a quote from something, from sure. some notes here <clears throat> that you've prepared. Anger is our chosen response mm -hmm. towards our environment for no longer meeting our addictive demands and expectations. Yes, and I think that's a very important statement that yeah. it's our chosen response. Yes. We like doing it <laughs> <laughs> because the alternative is too terrible for us. Yeah. The alternative, which is to feel the addiction and acknowledge we have one, which often feels shameful, and then going into the underlying fear that we have, which often feels terrifying, mm -hmm. and then the underlying grief that's generally suppressed by the fear, which feels very, very sad, yeah. Right. We want to avoid all of those emotions. We've now got, you know, three sets of emotions by this layer to, to address at least. And so we want to go back to having control over our environment yeah. rather than dealing with all of those emotions. Yeah. And, and it's a, it lacks personal responsibility doing it, but we choose to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a choice. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a real decided choice inside of our soul to go there. And because it's such a strong decision to go there, it instantly damages our soul further. Yeah. And this is why God made it that way, is because it, God wants to give us the feedback that this kind of anger is, a, it is very, very bad for damaging. not only, and damaging for ourselves and for our environment and for other people. Yeah. And, and it's the precursor to physical, sexual and emotional violence mm -hmm. towards others. And which, which obviously causes a very rapid degradation in our soul condition if we engage in those yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can I read another sentence from your notes here? Sure. Anger is created in order to feel more personal power or control over our own pain. Yes, and this is what we need to start seeing it as, is it's a personal selfish response. Mm -hmm in order to avoid just what's going on inside of ourselves. It's got nothing to do really with anyone else. Mm -hmm. It's got everything to do with what we're attempting to avoid inside of ourselves. And this is how we need to see it. We want power and control over what is happening inside of ourselves. We don't want to feel out of control yeah. with regard to our painful emotions. We want to feel in control of these painful emotions. And that's what causes us to revert to rage and anger mm -hmm. and that's what causes us to project it outwards from ourselves yeah. because we don't want to feel what's going on inside of ourselves mm -hmm. yeah mm. so all of this stuff is all an avoidance even fear is like that too an avoidance of what's going on inside of yourself and you can justify it any way you want but in the end this is inside of you and if you ever want to be at one with God or ever want to be a loving person you're going to need to have ways to release all of this without reverting to the attempt to control your environment. Yeah. 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 Okay. Or even the c attempt to control our own pain. We're exactly. going to have to move through that, aren't we? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And this is what, and we keep saying this in all of these questions, the attempt to control our pain or to suppress our pain and to not feel our pain is the major cause of all of the unloving actions that are ever taken. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, if, if you just allow yourself to feel your pain, you will immediately improve in your condition of love because you will no longer take actions that damage other people or yourself. Because you'll no longer act to suppress the pain. Correct. Yeah. So, so just that one simple act, that one simple change, and it's quite a difficult change <laughs> yeah. for most people to make, yeah. but it's a simple change in the sense that it's simple to understand. The willingness to feel our own pain will cause us to shift through all sorts of unloving behavior that we would have pre previously reverted to yep. just because we were trying to avoid our own pain. Yeah, and, and that probably leads to the final yes. quote. Yep. 
Anger is a desire within us to blame and punish our environment for what is within ourselves. Yes. So you can see that it's like we're, we're desiring to not take any responsibility for what's inside of us. Now, I'm not saying here that we have to take responsibility for what, who created it, because mm -hmm. most of the time we did not create, or a fair portion of the time, we did not create a lot of the original damage. Mm -hmm. We have since made choices that are unloving, which definitely have created damage. So we're not immu immune from the creation of our own damage. Yes. In, in other words, there are things within us that were created by others, and then we made unloving choices ourselves, and, that ha and so the damage created by that has been created by ourselves, mm -hmm. not others. Mm -hmm. And there are both sets of emotions within us. They're within us. Only we can control their release. Only we can release them. Mm -hmm. Nobody else can do it for us. So every time we blame our environment and try to gain power our, over our environment and try to affect our environment in some way, all we're doing is telling ourselves that we're not taking any personal responsibility for what's within us. We don't believe that we should have to feel what's within us, right? And we do. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reality, we do, because we are the only ones who can. Yeah. Once it's in us, nobody else can release it for us. Only we can release it. So we do have to take responsibility for what's in us, even though we don't need to take responsibility for everything that's in us, in terms of its creation, we do have to take responsibility for everything that's in us in terms of its release. And this is it's so important that we understand this. Yeah. And because most of us don't want to do that, yeah. we revert to anger. We don't want to take that responsibility. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have to feel everything. We want the people who created it to have to feel it. And if it's not them, we want somebody else to have to feel it instead. Yeah. You know, and the reality is, you know, for many of us, our parents have died or whatever, so we no longer feel we can blame them. And so what we do is we blame everybody else for what they did, <laughs> which, which is basically causing damage to everyone else because we do not want to take responsibility for feeling what's inside of us ourselves without hurting others. Yeah. That's our primary reason for anger. And it's such a damaging emotion and we need to understand and recognize that it is. And there is only one way to feel it that's in harmony with love. And that is without projecting it on anyone else. Yeah. And, and that is an exercise of your will. You can do that by using your will. Mm -hmm. right? And this is how powerful your will is. Yeah. But for most of us, our will is exercised completely different to that. What we do is we exercise our will to blame everybody, damn it, you know, hurt anybody else, punish them. We, blame, we want to get everything back to how it was. And so, you know, we manipulate and we control and that's how we use our will. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to do that, we will never be at one with God. We're never going to understand love and we are never going to be happy because we're going to continually create more pain for our own soul. Yeah. So I feel it's very important that we understand the relationship between these three groups of emotions. Yep. So I suppose that's what we could say in conclusion to this mm -hmm. whole session, mm -hmm. is that we, we really need to make sure that we understand the relationship between all of these emotions. So the relationship between fear, grief, firstly, you know, the underlying causal grief, the fear that covers it, the, the addictions that, that we use to get away from our fears, and then the anger that we use to manipulate people into meeting our addictions. <laughs> we need to understand the relationship between these emotions before we can really understand any of our emotional problems. And so what we'd like to recommend to everybody to do is to actually go through these FAQs, these ones that we've covered just so far on emotion and the one on how the human soul functions, and see what their belief systems are about why they feel they should be able to revert to anger, yeah. why they feel they should have their addictions met, and why they feel avoidance of their causal emotion is actually going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel it's been, a, this session in particular has been a great session in terms of an introduction to the really core uh, principal emotions that affect us negatively and mm. have the, and that we have the power to deal with in a different way and change our lives around completely mm. um, and certainly grow in love and grow towards God uh, and thank you so much for your time today because I feel that um, everything we covered is so powerful and um, 
I would encourage people viewing this session to get really honest and real with yourself. Uh, living in denial of what's within us just delays our progress even further. Mm -hmm. And so I know that coming to grips with the fact that we've got lots of addictions and lots of anger and the fact that our pain is never going to leave us until we deal with it can feel fairly um, well painful and difficult. And confronting and, and confronting all those things. And confronting and we have all these judgments. <laughs> and humiliating and, and all, all these other things. <laughs> all these things, all these things. Yeah. But um, delaying the process doesn't make it easier. No. Uh, and actually commencing the progress when we do it sincerely things do start to feel better and more real and we begin to work through all these false beliefs that we have. So yes. I would really encourage you to start yeah. that journey. So what we're going to do next time we get together with you is we're going to start answering people's individual questions yeah. about their emotions and their emotional feelings and what they feel about different things with their relationship with God and so forth. And we're going to focus on looking at the different emotions in, that are contained within these questions that individuals have asked. There's, there's quite a few hundred of them. <laughs> so uh, obviously this is going to happen over months of period or, or perhaps even years, <laughs> the way it's going. But um, well, what we'd like to do is cover a lot of these emotional questions because it is such an essential part of your future development. You need to allow yourself to become sensitive emotionally you're going to need to become sensitive to God's emotions if you're ever going to become at one with God. And, and to feel God's love, you're going to need to feel all of your resistances to feeling it. So, so we'd really like to encourage you to feel your emotions and be more honest about your emotions and more honest about your fears and your addictions and your anger and, and all of those and all the denials that you have because that will help you in your relationship with God. So hopefully this session has helped you a little along that path. <laughs> Thanks for your time and we'd See like to you. thank the time for Mary as well who's done all of this interviewing and, and Lena and Igor who are behind our cameras as well. Yeah. Thanks guys.